Welcome back again and welcome to the last panel session of this conference on International Peace Day. To conclude today's conference, we will be looking at an issue that has been touched upon in um, all of the previous sessions, really. Um, it is um, about the fact that curbing online hate speech and harmful content in the digital sphere isn't really a black and white science. It's not clear cut. It is often a very thin line, you will agree, between contradictory principles. On the one hand, freedom of speech versus inciting hate and violence. On the one hand, the spread of information, but polluted by waves of disinformation. So it might seem easy enough to try and rein in abuses on the basis of human rights principles, for example, but reality checks, and we've discussed some in the previous sessions, and putting that into practice shows that a universal one-size-fits-all approach globally doesn't work so very well, or not always. It's quite clear that social, cultural and linguistic nuances need to be taken into account when moderating and curating online content. Now, the question is, how? Is, for example, artificial intelligence intelligent enough to do that? Are we humans? And are companies and policymakers prepared to invest what it takes to achieve that? And in doing so, does it help promoting peace? Lots of questions and we have a um, fantastic panel to um, put their ideas about all these questions to you, for you. Um, let me present them, they're all there. Hello. Um, first and foremost, Anna Herold is here, head of unit of the Media Pluralism Department of the DG Connect of the European Commission. Julie Owono is also among us, board member of the Facebook Oversight Board and Director General of Internet Without Borders. Welcome to both of you. Pierre-François Dauquier is uh, one of the panelists as well, head of the Media Freedom Programme at Article 19. Jonathan Bright is um, part of the panel, Associate Professor at the Oxford Internet Institute. And Andrew Puderpat is also among us, Internet Policy Expert and author. A warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. And then usually, if this were a live audience, we would have a round of applause, a warm bath of applause. Now you'll have to imagine it, of course. So let's get down to business. The theme we will be discussing is indeed the matter of context, contextualization of online hateful content in order to foster peace. That's the question. I want to start with a more general um, question to you, Anna Harold, um, to kick off. What do you believe? Can online harmful content really destabilize peace and democracy in the EU? I've asked this question before. I'm interested to know what you think about that. Thank you for inviting me uh, to this and uh, I think highly you need interesting to unmute panel. yourself. The first person I am this morning unmuted. did the I same thing. Unmuted. We're still not hearing you. I, I, I. It's OK. Just keep talking. We, you'll come through, I'm told. Do, do go ahead. Uh, can you hear me now? No, it's fine. Ah, yes, Andrea, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to thank uh, for having me in this uh, great uh, lineup uh, and uh, to discuss a very difficult subject matter uh, with people that are certainly more expert than I am. Uh, what I can bring is, of course, a regulatory perspective, because this is what we do at the European Commission. We look at all these issues from um, a regulatory perspective. And what I can certainly say is that uh, whenever we start discussing uh, issues um, around uh, content online and how it may affect democracy and peace, I think we should uh, be very clear about I the notions and I distinguish between the different notions. So I think we should certainly, you know, uh, our moderator has uh, said it 
all, but we should be uh, reminded how important it is to be uh, clear that one thing is illegal content, and here we are talking about incitement to hatred, incitement to violence, potentially glorification of terrorism, provocation to commit terrorist offenses or child pornography. So that's, of course, a very different category. Then we, uh, of course, can speak about harmful content, and especially in EU uh, legislation, we use that term um, a lot when speaking about content that, uh, um, from a regulatory perspective, might be considered uh, as something to restrict access to for special vulnerable groups of society, such as children. Uh, and then, of course, there is the, the whole debate that I understand was very topical in um, today's conference, uh, disinformation, which is yet a very different animal. So I think that this clarity in terms of uh, the different categories of content we are talking about uh, is very important. And then um, to answer your question, uh, I think it is very clear that uh, many categories or most categories of illegal content that I mentioned, um, uh, terrorist content, incitement to violence, incitement to hate, hatred, obviously have a direct impact on how our democracies work. And we have now the new systematic disinformation phenomenon that um, of course is much more difficult to regulate. Nevertheless, of course, especially uh, when it is purported by state or political forces can have a devastating impact on democracies. And we have seen that um, uh, also here on the European soil and the context of several elections that we have had. Uh, and the pandemic that we have been living through has also shown that it might not only be directly you know, impacting the political processes, but might also have a very um, a, pro a very big impact on 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 several policies that uh, that, that might be extremely important, such as health policies that uh, that that of course um, were deeply impacted by this uh, phenomenon. So to uh, to for a short answer, yes, but we should be sometimes you know a little careful not to throw the three speech baby with the disinformation bathwater when we are talking about how um, all these different types of content can impact democracies. Thank you very much for that. That was uh, very clear. I want to pick up on the point of what you said, where you said online hate does have a direct impact and you illustrated it. Professor Bright, I want to come to you. Um, what does exist in academia? Um, what kind of academic evidence is there of a, of a direct link between online violent content and what happens in the offline world world um, where does it start in the offline world and then is reflected in the online world or vice versa thanks a lot thanks for the invitation to be here this is a great question it's a critically important one it is really hard to answer establishing causality for violence is notoriously complex people who go out and commit violence especially random acts of violence or politically motivated violence against people they don't know are pretty rare. And studying things that are pretty rare is always complicated. We do have some evidence, laboratory evidence, showing uh, exposure to different types of hateful messages, increasing people's threat perceptions or activating things that might be associated with um, legitimizing violence. Uh, there've also been uh, one or two studies so he's from Warwick Business School, perhaps most notably, um, associating increasing social media use in a given area with increasing patterns of uh, immigrant related violence in, in that area, violence against immigrants, I should say. Um, so there is some evidence that there's also, and I think this should be said, an enormous amount of evidence, which, while circumstantial, is nevertheless building up to be pretty important. You know, it's difficult to think of a lone actor terrorist attack in recent years that didn't have some kind of online component that this person wasn't active online in some way and we can point to an enormous amount of violence events the, what happened in Myanmar um, the organization of ISIS um, 
most recently, just uh, last week or the week before, there was a, a, a relatively violent attempt to break into the UK medical um, health agency, uh, the one that regulates vaccines, organised entirely in, in a telegram group. So we can see all of these things happening online and having strong online connections. Now, of course, are people radical and then they seek out content online which confirms these beliefs? Or are they somewhat radical and then they find content online and this pushes them even, even further? It, it's very hard to say that precisely. And if we're really honest, probably both of these types of people exist. But I think that the evidence that we should do something about online violent content or that the, the balance of evidence that we should do something about online violent content for me is, is overwhelming. And indeed, we have been discussing um, what can be done. And one of the um, instruments that we've been discussing is legislation, legal framework, or, but also non-legal frameworks and rules. Um, Ms. Harold, I come back to you uh, in that regard. We've been discussing earlier uh, in the day the EU code of conduct and code of practices on, on discrimination, for example. Um, is it fair to say that there's a shift from self-regulatory approach to more strict regulation with DSA and uh, DSM in the making um, without going very much into the detail of what that will end up as. DSA, DSM is still in the making, as I said. But is, is the general feeling that there needs to be more control, um, legislative control, um, and, and put forward by whom? And how far does that go or can that potentially go? Well, I, I can certainly say that um, there is uh, a perceived need, uh, especially you know, from uh, the European regulatory perspective, that uh, that that the self-regulatory tools that we have developed are extremely useful, and they should. Um, continue and uh, continue to be developed and reinforced and also enlarged in terms of, you know, possible um, uh, signatories, for example, now we are trying to enlarge this, uh, the, the circle of signatories of the code of conduct on disinformation and the same happened for the hate speech uh, code of conduct where over the years we have seen, um, you know, a, a broad participation from different actors in it but that these initiatives are considered to be in a way a preparation for a more stable core regulatory framework that again might not necessarily capture all the players on the market but might be like for example under the proposed dsa uh, concern you know certain players uh, that have a particular impact uh, on the market and on uh, dissemination of um, illegal and harmful content. So yes, there is a shift from self-regulation to core regulation. And this is something that we have uh, actively promoted, also including via our audiovisual media framework that, as you know, has also evolved from a framework that concerned television in the 80s to a framework that uh, um, involved then the video um, on demand players that were also new at the time. And also we were talking a lot about self-regulation and the video on demand sector, for example, as regards advertising. Uh, and uh, now also video sharing platforms that are also, um, we should not forget it, uh, now regulated uh, under EU law as regards um, uh, you know the basic uh, standards regulatory standards uh, for uh, online content so the short answer again here yes there is an evolution and i think that we should all uh, look at this evolution very positively because it shows that it's an evolution that is in a way a very natural one and i think also welcome by the regulatees uh, because it also shifts a bit the burden from private enforcement to, you know, to, to public enforcement, which is very much something that I think we cherish here in Europe and also something where the freedom of speech, you know, finds, you know, it, it, it plays, you know, because this is at the core of the, of the European approach of regulating content. Mm -hmm. And indeed, um, Ms. Harold, that is what uh, I think it was... Um, uh, the representative for Facebook uh, has said that indeed they welcomed um, 
to shift the burden on deciding what's, uh, uh, what's acceptable and what not, or share that burden at least with uh, public authorities um, is welcome indeed. But you mentioned freedom of speech and you said earlier, um, let's not throw away the baby uh, freedom of speech away with uh, the, the bath water or uh, the bath tub um, when we criticize online hate speech. Um, that's really um, up Mr. Dukir's lane because you are very, very um, keen on guarding this um, um, the, f the, the line where uh, legislation curbs freedom of speech, isn't it? Um, so, so wherein lies the rub? Uh, to cite Shakespeare. What is the difficulty with um, safeguarding freedom of speech when curbing online hate speech? Thank you for the, for the question. And, and first of all, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here on, on this panel. Um, I think one, one way to, to look at the question is to announce the framework for the regulation of online content, and especially on, on social media, is, is changing. And, and there are changes, um, among other things, in, in the legislation with um, an intention to have stricter uh, and more effective rules than the, the uh, pre-existing state of, of, of self-regulation uh, uh, in the sense of the industry regulating itself. Um, there are, it, it, it would be a very complex and technical discussion to engage into, uh, for instance, looking at the, the DSA and, and it's not, not even finished. So it's, it's a really complicated um, discussion, but maybe I can offer a few general observations on, on the evolution of, of legislation. Um, there, are, there are a few things that, that in, in laws can, can undermine freedom of expression. And, and first of all, is the use of, of concepts that are too vague or, or too, which, which lend themselves to too broad an interpretation. Um, and in, in that sense, there's a, a worrying trend to, uh, on, on, um, in, in legislative initiatives to focus on harmful content, on online harms, which, which are um, very, very broad and, and very hard to define uh, concepts. So, so that, that is, that is um, a path towards um, unjustifiable restrictions on freedom of expression. Another um, problem, for instance, is uh, situations in which the legislators uh, impose um, very short deadlines to social media platforms for the removal of, uh, of unlawful or, or otherwise problematic content. Um, that, that is also um, a very clear incitement to over uh, removal of, of content that, that should not be um, removed, that, that should not be um, censored. Um, and, and generally, there's, there's also a, a problem that um, any flaw in a legislation that, that could still work in a democratic country, you know, uh, because there are safeguards, there are tribunals, etc. cetera, but, but an imperfect legislative model will, and it's, there's been studies that have shown that, that an imperfect legislative model will uh, be replicated and serve as a source of, of inspiration for very restrictive laws in less democratic or authoritarian regimes. And that's, that's bound to be a disaster for freedom of expression and other um, fundamental rights. Um, and, and maybe a final observation uh, on uh, the new legislations that are, that are emerging is, is uh, um, I think it, you know, it may make sense to have new uh, legal obligations for um, instance on, on transparency or um, the fact that platforms would have to adopt um, appropriate measures to, to deal with categories, uh, neatly defined categories of, of um, content. Um, but but there, is, there is a sort of a missing piece or, or at least there's space for um, an, an independent uh, multi-stakeholder forum that could sort of help bringing society back into the into the debate, and that's the the sense of the proposal of Article 19 to uh, to develop what we've called a social media um, council, which which essentially would be a multi-stakeholder 
organism that would operate on the basis of international standards on, on freedom of expression and on their fundamental uh, rights. And that could, I think, play a key role in the implementation of, uh, of the new rules and the new legislations that are emerging um, in, in the sense of, of bringing stakeholders together in what could become a co-learning space for the discussion of the implementation of, of, the, new, of the new laws, as well as, as generally for the uh, application of international standards to content moderation um, cases. Um, and, and I think there's there's a what's at stake there is is really bringing um, the diversity of, of voices in society into the conversation on content moderation. And I think that that's um, well, that, that's probably very close to the topic of this panel. But that's also I think um, maybe a missing piece in in the uh, emerging framework that that we can see uh, at the moment. Um, and I'll stop here uh, for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. One, one more uh, follow-up question, just to clarify. The social media council you're talking about, um, is this one big organization or do you see this locally embedded and would this be a network of uh, social media councils? Just very briefly to be sure. Um, so it, it, it's a model that we think should be implemented at the national level. Um, in order to enable local voices to have a say in content moderation uh, oversight that, that impacts their society, basically. Um, of course, there are countries where there may be safety concerns. Um, so, of course, that, that, that is not possible to uh, create a social media council in such context. And, and of course, there's also the issue of a possible capture of such uh, mechanism by private or public forces. So, so um, the idea of uh, the project of creating that sort of multi-stakeholder institution must be approached uh, with, with caution and with a clear understanding of the of the local context of course but but the idea is that um, we think it can serve at the, at the local level at the national level as an instrument to to enable local voices to take part in the conversation about content moderation of content that, that impacts their society Thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, I want to go to uh, Ms. Owono. Uh, welcome to you too. Um, you're a member of the Facebook Oversight Board. Before we go into that, what do you think of this uh, suggestion of Mr. Dokir for social media councils? Um, are you open to it? Do you see, do you think it, it might be useful? No, I think it's absolutely, I agree with, uh, with um, Pierre-François on that, uh, that it's really, uh, time to uh, have all included in the content moderation conversation, which is, uh, well, which tends to be a conversation which tends to be focused a lot on North America and Western Europe. Uh, whereas we know that many of the, the dangers uh, that are, we still don't know about are deploying their effects, their very negative effects on very fragile societies. Uh, in countries that are not located in these two spheres, uh, I mean, in these two spaces of the world. So I do think there is time, absolutely, it is right now time for this inclusion. Um, and uh, yes, would love to, to, to continue the conversation on, on that with Article 19, which has been already an organization um, that has helped us, uh, helped us a lot understand all these issues. Um, yeah, that's what I can respond, respond to that. That's a clear response. Um, so you're open to this. Um, if we then compare um, what you're doing now, uh, or compare the idea of these social media councils to what you're doing now in the Facebook Oversight Board, um, you're discussing amongst you, I think you're 20 members now, going up to 40 shortly. Um, you're discussing amongst yourselves cases of information being flagged and then decide, uh, you, you put out a statement on what you think should be done with it. I'm briefly summarizing, I'll let you uh, specify mm -hmm. in a moment. Um, but so far, you haven't even reached 20 decisions. So what is really the impact of what you're doing uh, and how critical can you be, are you, of uh, what Facebook puts out, so to speak? Mm. Uh, thank you so much for, for this. Indeed, the, the, the Facebook Oversight Board is a unique um, experiment institution built being built uh, that makes binding decision. I think that part is extremely important because that's the only example uh, that exists. The only organization that makes binding decision on 
the company's content moderation decisions. So in this case, Facebook, but particularly Facebook and Instagram, two social networks. Uh, not only do we make those binding decisions, but we also make recommendations. So far, we have indeed only made, uh, to the frustration of, of many, uh, only made 15 decisions. But this only is quite relative because the, um, the cases that we choose, uh, we choose them because, particularly because of the impact that they can have, not only in the case of the user, who will see uh, their content being restored or being taken down because, I mean, their content, the content that they see being taken down, because as you might be aware, we all, we not only look at content that was taken down by the platform, but also content that is still available and that users think should not be there, which is a big problem for disinformation. And so we choose cases that could potentially have the largest impact beyond the borders of the country concerned and the well, the individual life at stake. Uh, one recent example is a case we accepted and we made a decision uh, on a, a pu publication shared by Al Jazeera, in which uh, the Al Qassam Brigade in um, in, um, uh, in in Palestine were warning, basically, of war 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 crimes, potential war crimes. Um, uh, we're warning Israelis of potential war crimes in the framework of the, uh, you know, the skirmish that happened earlier this year. And it was shared by Al Jazeera, and then it was shared by a user, an Egyptian user. And that's when Facebook took took it down. The fa Facebook took down the publication that was uh, reshared by the Egyptian user. Uh, what we said in that case, although it was concerning an Egyptian, so not even someone who's based in Palestine, but although we, uh, you know, had this very specific case, we nevertheless, this was an extremely great opportunity to question generally moderation of Facebook in that region and particularly in the Israel and Palestine conflict. There are suspicions of bias. We don't know. We are asking the company to audit, audit itself. Um, we are also, um, we also told the company, uh, because not only do we make the binding decision, but also we can make recommendations to which the company must respond within 30 days. So not only did we tell the company to audit its moderation bias, potentially, but also to be more transparent, to disclose the government request that are not based on the law. Because one thing that we, the public, the general public learned with this uh, Israel and Palestine conflict in general is that there, there are units, government units that work with social media platforms and particularly here with Facebook and Instagram and make requests to take down content that are not necessarily based on a legislation. So this is extremely problematic because we have an area, a gray area where there is no law uh, but nevertheless, the government will uh, demand censorship. So this has to be put in the public sight and criticized because there certainly are a lot of abuses without any oversight. So um, yes, while it's the social, I mean, I think that the logic behind the social media console is, is, is different and it's definitely going to be helpful for the work that the board does. Uh, the board will not be able to solve all the problems, although uh, we are trying really our best to make the, the decisions get, that can help the company advance. It's, you know, do better uh, in terms of content moderation. And I would say that so far it's pretty satisfying, um, although still a lot to, needs to be done, obviously. But it's extremely encouraging to know that Facebook takes the mission <clears throat> seriously and responds to all the recommendations that we made. Uh, it has opened up conversations on aspects of moderation that were unknown in the public side, or at least if you were not an expert, you didn't know about those. Uh, so in all, I think that the level of transparency that the board has helped brought, the level of uh, understanding and of um, you know fairness, basically, that the board has been uh, able to do and continues to to bring to to users is uh, is encouraging. And yeah, I hopefully uh, we will do way more when we're many more on the board. Okay, um, we'll hold you to that. Um, we'll come back to what you were just saying. I, I want to go back to uh, Professor Bright um, because in this content moderation, um, we've been talking uh, in the previous sessions about the human component, but also the uh, artificial intelligence uh, component. Um, can AI 
be a solution in being more can contextualizing um, and, and taking into account all the nuances according to um, the, the place where something takes place or is something, uh, something is put out, do you think? Or will you always need um, this human eye, this human mind to really gouge the uh, weight of a certain assertion? I mean, that's a fascinating question. I think that there's no doubt that you can include contextual factors in artificial intelligence. It's absolutely set up to do that. I think there are big uh, ethical questions here about what that means for decisions, um, whether the decision on what you say is hate speech or not is based solely on the text, if you like, of that speech, or whether we include contextual factors. What does that mean? Is it about who you are? Is it about where you are? Is it about which groups you belong to? Does that mean some people are more likely or less likely to be speaking hate speech just by the virtue of their group characteristics? So I think these are really difficult questions and they become even more complex if we leave a machine to decide them uh, by themselves. I think we can all imagine uh, plenty of ways in which that, uh, which that can go wrong. It's undoubtedly the case that AI has to be some part of the solution, just the sheer volume of content on social media means that you know we can't expect human moderators to look at it all but i think it'd be very uncomfortable with having decisions especially decisions on content which has never been seen before like ai can be very good you know let's find all the copies of the charlestown um massacre for instance like the, you, you know these kind of things ai can work very well with. but for the sort of content which is contains novel ideas and has never been seen before i think at best it's uh, part of the solution, uh, ordering content and perhaps making the work of human moderators more efficient. Of course, it's also worth saying that understanding context for human moderators is notoriously extremely difficult. You know, we've had many problems in the UK uh, in the past of understanding the difference between far-right terrorism and Islamist terrorism. How much context do you need to have to know whether a 14 or 15-year-old boy is just sounding off you know, just sort of releasing some steam versus genuinely doing something which might be might be dangerous. So it, it, enormously difficult also for humans uh, to get right as well. But do you feel it can be done? Because uh, Facebook and Google were er saying earlier, uh, we're going to invest more, uh, we take this seriously, we, we, we're going to put our money where our mouth is. C can it be done? Or are you saying, like they always also implied, look, we, we will not ever be able to really um, hold back all the harmful content on our platforms. It's simply impossible. Do you agree? I don't see a, a solution in the near term where all harmful content is deleted through any system. And I think, you know, it, it's worth considering it as well. That it's simply deleting harmful content at the end of the day, you haven't removed the reason for which that was created. Um, and uh, have you really addressed the core problem there uh, or not? I think that, um, but it's also another point here is worth, and I think it's quite interesting also in light of the recent sort of leaks about there being a kind of two-tiered system for content moderation um, within some of the big uh, platforms. AI will be great at capturing thousands or tens of thousands of people, a hundred thousands of people saying something racist during the course of a sports match. You know, and they, they just say something racist about another uh, another group or country, and that's important. That should exist. But when we are start talking about hate speech as a policy problem, usually the people we're talking about are much smaller groups of more careful, considered, politically active people who will produce statements which are much more within the borderline. And uh, you, you know, if if you like, they also will play against. Uh, AI. And it's very interesting to look at, you know, for example, how the NetsDG law has been weaponized. People post things which are sort of borderline, they'll get deleted, and they'll screenshot that deletion. And say, look, you can't even say this anymore. So I don't think there is any automatic solution to this. And I think that the, the groups who are really organized and doing hate speech in a systematic way um, know about this and will, will work against the AI as it's produced. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Dokir, I want to bring you in uh, again. Uh, Mr. Puthepat, I haven't forgotten about you. I'm uh, coming to you uh, in a moment. Um, but Mr. Dokir, I, I wondered if you wanted to add something to that. Um, you've already highlighted some of the uh, problems with um, targeting uh, online hate speech. Um, but AI is not going to provide the ultimate solution. Contextualization can only take you so far, apparently. Do you agree? Um, I'm not an expert on the technical side of AI, but I think that from a human rights perspective, making sure that um, human rights are built in the design of AI system should be something that we need to work on more. Um, I think there's also a question of uh, designing the, the right degree of transparency around those um, those software and, and making sure, again, that there's um, societal participation in the decisions that are made about how these um, systems should should operate. I think that's that's the sort of lines of thought that we have in relation to uh, to uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, because um, um, Mrs. Owono earlier, we had um, the example of um, Someone speaking from um, on behalf of, of uh, press council in Bosnia Herzegovina saying, "Well, uh, certain journalistic pieces were taken down." Who mentioned um, one of the war criminals uh, from the past, um, and without any um, nuance in whether this was in the context of an explanatory journalistic sound piece or whether this was to incite hate and violence. Is that something you on the oversight board also look out for and, and take into account? Have you um, put out recommendations on uh, contextualization to Facebook and how did they respond? Yes, contextualization is absolutely part of, very essential actually to uh, the conversations that we, uh, we, we have at the oversight board. Um, maybe to, to respond to that question, I think it, it's better when we have examples. So I'll just share with you some of the cases in which we have called out the company for not taking into account that, that contextualization. Um, so we received, we received a case that involved a, um, you know, a bot, we call it internally the Myanmar bot criticisms of China. Uh, it's one of our most recent decision, and it's about a user who posted, um, who criticized the, the military, the Myanmar military after the coup. And uh, he used the real terms that Facebook has listed as profanity against another community, and particularly Chinese nationals. Um, and as you may be aware, Facebook has a list of slurs, and they're automatically, I mean, usually when that slur will appear on the platform, it will be removed uh, under the hate speech community standards. So um, after we've consulted with civil society organizations, with local experts, including linguistic experts, um, commissioning a contextual, contextual translation, well, we overturned Facebook's initial decision uh, because we found that while the profanity was used uh, in the post, it, targe it targeted Chinese not as you know individuals or people, but rather the government, the, the state, uh, because well there is a discussion right now on the implication of, of you know the Chinese government or at least China in the um, the well the um, instability right now in, in Myanmar. So uh, we we identified that Facebook's removal was. Uh, mainly a result of insufficient translation, lack of context, like like we, we could rest some, summarize. And we also um, made a policy recommendation to make sure that the internal implementation standards, which are used by the, well, internally by the company, including by the moderators, well, to make sure that they are available in the language spoken by the moderators. Because when we talk about context, well, language is one part of that, and the most important one, especially for a platform, an American platform that is global uh, and where the, the well, the main language used is, is English. I mean, not the main, but it's you know the default language of the the, the the platform and the company. So it's important to make sure that you're speaking to all your audience, to all your staff, 
uh, around the world. And it's surprising that it's something that we still have to talk about. Another case that I would like to mention with regards to, to Comsex is the hydroxychloroquine case that we received. It was one of our early cases last, last year. And uh, it concerned a, a publication in a group that claimed a certain drug uh, as a cure for COVID-19 and that criticized the French government's response to the pandemic. And uh, it was, well, in this time, it's Facebook which reached out to us because I didn't mention, but not only can users reach out to the board, but also Facebook when it struggles to apply its own standards. So in this case, Facebook reached out to us and we decided to overturn. Uh, they didn't know whether or not they should, um, uh, you know, delete the content. And we decided to overturn uh, Facebook's decision uh, and we asked the company to restore the content, noting that the, the post did not create, um, you know, there was no imminent threat because that's, we had a conversation earlier about that. What is the, the relationship between online and, and offline? And I think we, we here gave some clues on that and decided it was not, there was no threat. In addition, we criticized Facebook uh, for scattering around its policies on COVID-19 response. And we asked the company to make sure that uh, the, these, policies are comprehensively put in the same place uh, in the community standard. So, uh, but back to the, the context, yes, we saw that there was no imminent art. We had the opportunity to uh, receive a briefing about, uh, you know, the, the, well, the government's response, the French government response, but generally about how medication is put on the market in France and made accessible to, to users, uh, to, to patients. And we saw, we saw in this case that the curing question, I don't want to mention the name, the curing question was not freely accessible. You need you needed a govern, um, um, doctor paper, I don't know, ordonnance in French, I don't know what's the word in English. Anyway, just to say that, yes, we do remind always that to the company that context is extremely important. Uh, we know that the problematic of scale is, uh, is another problem, but I really do think that if we started with the language, if we worked more, no, well, that's more a, a position as a civil society leader here. If we uh, included more of the, you know, the, the the feedback and collaborated more more with local civil society organizations who are either trusted partners of Facebook or other companies uh, that have the same types of problems, but taking those programs further, you know, beyond just making sure that we highlight cases, we, we flag cases and make sure they're, you know, being dealt with with the company. I think there is definitely a possibility to actually tap into the knowledge and integrate that knowledge in the content policy processes, uh, in the process of creating the rules that are applied uh, on, on social media mm -hmm. platforms and, in, and also apply to uh, automated systems. But yeah, that's a more broad conversation, but just to say that the board is extremely sensitive to the issues yeah. around context. That's, that's, that's very clear. I want to move to uh, the issue of transparency, but I, I one um, brief reaction uh, from you, Julia Wano, uh, in that regard, because it was mentioned before by uh, Professor Bright that um, there is a two-tier, apparently, uh, reaction of Facebook towards certain um, uh, comments on their platforms. Um, very successful um, users of the platform with many, many, many followers can get away with more, apparently, than um, normal or more common users. Uh, and in, in this light, um, the oversight board was told, no, no, there's no problem. So basically you were lied to um, in, in a way, if I may uh, put it that bluntly. Um, how, how does that make you feel? Do you, do you feel that transparency is really an issue for Facebook or are they just trying to get away with as much as they can until they no longer can? Well, we see they can't. <laughs> well, the recent revelations prove they can't. And uh, well, I, I, I would say, uh, like the board has said publicly, uh, transparency, meaningful transparency, because we, we also have to qualify that transparency. The meaningful transparency that helps not only governments understand, uh, but general users, like normal users who are not experts, Meaningful transparency that allows this understanding is always going to be better for the company and will help the company not, you know, um, how, what's the word, you know, basically be light, treat lightly 
uh, its responsibility with regards to applying evenly the community standards around the world and also to all the users, as the board has said. So I think the the answer here will just will simply be meaningful transparency, and the board is committed to uh, continue to push for that. We have seen that our recommendations are. Uh, responded to by the company and are taken in, in, into account. Where, for instance, um, we, we we are extremely encouraged by the fact that the company has published, um, has recently um, launched a transparency center in which they gather all the disclosures, the public disclosures that they make, their transparency reports, but also uh, the recommendations that the board has made and the responses that they brought to those, but also the modifications of the community standards. I mean, really transparency center. Okay. So all in all, we're going, but we will need to go to more meaningful transparency and nobody yeah. can get away from that. But you're giving them the benefit of the doubt so far uh, or, or until now. No, that's not what, what I I'm said. Uh, I just said we're pushing for transparency. That's exactly what I said. Okay. And we'll continue to do that. In your own words, as it should be. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, Mr. Puthapat, uh, that brings me to you. Um, you've, you've had to be patient, but um, we do want to hear uh, what you have to say. You um, were involved in the UNESCO report on transparency online. Uh, you drafted it. Um, were any of these issues addressed in that in that report? And is transparency online? Is it possible at all, in fact? Or is this an ideal um, idea and aim? Uh, yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. I mean, yeah, obviously, all of the issues we've discussed so far were addressed in the report because the report's looking at uh, UNESCO's brief or mandate is to look at free expression and privacy. And those are core issues that underpin everything that's been discussed so far today. And I think you heard already from, from a range of, of speakers the complexities of dealing with content issues online, uh, given a number of factors. Firstly, the ubiquity of a certain small number of platforms and the fact that you have billions of users on a very concentrated set of platforms. You have vast amounts of content. Uh, YouTube has an hour of content uploaded every single second. So the idea that we can apply traditional offline means of monitoring and recording and dealing with speech in an online environment, it's just a fantasy. It's, it's just not possible given the sheer volume. So we are going to rely a lot on machine learning and techniques like that to manage the kind of content. And a number of the issues that people have become concerned about online, like disinformation or misinformation, are frankly uh, as old as human societies. I mean, politicians are public figures have lied throughout history. Um, they lie, offline media lies. I mean, journalists every day or commentators misinform, uh, you know, lie, create disinformation. So there's nothing new about the online platforms and disinformation. And there's no, I'm not aware of any human rights principle that says that disinformation should be prohibited. I mean, we've never sought on human rights grounds to ban a politician for telling an untruth or distorting the truth. We've, we've accepted that as part of the kind of process of politics and expecting competitive speech to deal with false and misleading speech. So there's a number of these things that are kind of swirling around. And I think the approach that UNESCO has taken and which I was involved in is, is let's, let's start by trying to encourage the companies or promote the companies into being more open about how they're managing content issues across a whole range of these concerns. So not necessarily making judgments about what they should be doing, but let's at least understand what they are doing and how they're doing it and what techniques they're deploying. So the initial stage was to develop a set of high level principles, which were drawn up in consultation with the companies, the, the major social media companies and with civil society groups and with regulators, because one of the things we recognize is that transparency isn't a one size fits all requirement as a user. I probably want to know what's happening to the content I'm interested in and what's happening to my data. A regulator has a much broader range of interests in terms of how a company is dealing with those issues. The Facebook Oversight Board would have a different set of requirements about what it would need to know in order to make a proper judgment. Article 19 would have, again, a different set of interests in understanding how a company is applying, if it is, a if it is applying, human rights principles to the way it manages speech. So there's a, the, 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 the initial principles can be fairly high level, but I think the stage we've reached now is sitting down and saying, okay, it's very good to say, be transparent about AI, or whether AI you're using uh, conforms with human rights norms, 
What does that mean in practice? What does that mean in actual engineering terms? What is it you actually want to know and how can you know it? Does it depend on the data set? Does it depend on the code? Does it depend on the biases within the engineering department itself, et cetera, et cetera? So I think that the next stage we've reached in, in terms of the debate about transparency, it's not the high level principles about being open. Everybody kind of agrees with that and we all kind of know it's a good thing. We're now at the stage of saying, what does it practically mean and what is meaningful transparency? In the words that Lawrence Lezard used, is it legible, not just is it transparent? But when you create this information, is it just a data dump or is there some kind of narrative that enables you to understand what the company is doing? Mm -hmm. So I think what UNESCO is doing, and, and we're working closely in partnership with the companies because a, a regulator would say you can't regulate social media companies without their cooperation. You, you actually can't. So at no, nothing we do can be done entirely without their cooperation and nothing can be done without an awareness of what governments are trying to do because you know governments are, quite often companies get blamed for what governments do you know governments force them to do stuff or demand they do things often quite repressive things like the russians have just demanded that google and apple remove the navalny tactical voting app and apple and google complied because the russians named local staff employed in russia and said we'll arrest them unless you remove that app and so google and, and apple put their local employees interest first above if you like the democratic norms that we would expect which is to allow a voter a tactical voting app nothing wrong with that any democracy but they withdrew it to protect those people so the other dimension to this which often not discussed is not just social media companies but what are governments doing and how are they intervening and what how are they trying to impact on things and the transparency needs to embrace those kinds of actions and those kinds of pressures on government on companies as well so i think we're at that stage now of We've, we all kind of know the high level principles. We all know what we broadly want to know. How do we know it? And how do we know it meaningfully? That's the really key question that I think we're having to look at next at this stage as UNESCO. And with all the context uh, involved, there is no such thing as one single kind of transparency is what I um, understand from what you're saying uh, to then help better govern uh, content. Um, I want to come back to you, Ms. Uh, Harold. Um, Talking to the companies is key uh, when you want to um, map out uh, legislation and, and get a better framework to work in uh, both as um, public authorities and the social network platforms themselves. Agree? I do, and I think it was just said, no, that the only model that can work uh, uh, in regulating the online environment is uh, co-regulation. No, and it's a bit of I'm a bit paraphrasing, no, what 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 has just been said, and and coming back to what I said before, and uh, probably this is something uh, that we are now a bit trying in Europe, no, because I think I would say that we we at least in Europe we are trying this model of co-regulation in online content moderation uh, via a, a mix of different instruments. And let's hope that we are going to be successful. And if I may just add one additional thing, because I think you, you brought, um, uh, the last speaker brought a very important uh, element. It is one side of the coin. And even in Europe, you are not free from what you uh, also raised, which is also how the states and political forces are using speech online for their own purposes and also how they are influencing media. And that's why we would like to complete what we are doing in terms of online content uh, regulation. Uh, with a specific framework that uh, has just been announced by the Commission President uh, to safeguard media independence and editorial independence uh, of the media in Europe, the Media Freedom Act. So I think it just shows that uh, even in Europe, you know, where I think we can try to put in place a well-functioning co-regulatory framework uh, for content issues, we also need something to rebalance also the, the, the landscape on the other side because of what's had, what has been happening in terms of media influence and media manipulation in at least some of the European countries. Thank you for completing that picture. That's of the essence, of course. And then um, lastly, I want to come back to Mr. Professor Bright um, because in 
partnership with UNESCO, uh, Oxford uh, Internet is working on a digital tool to monitor trends in uh, online hate speech. Can you say something about how that works and if that is maybe a step in the process that um, Mr. Puderpat uh, described um, towards more transparency, um, the transparency in full in, in all its uh, facets? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I mean, this is a brainchild, really, of, of UNESCO, and I'm very pleased to be working with them on it. And what they've asked for is uh, a tool that's simple, lightweight, quite cheap and easy to put together that allows uh, civil society actors or NGOs or even UNESCO country officers themselves in a given country or region to understand something about what's happening in trends in hate speech in their area. Um, it won't do everything. You can't do everything. Um, uh, well, you can't do everything. Uh, you, can, you never can. But uh, it, it aims to shed a little bit of light and works closely with country partners to try and, for example, forewarn them if there's a new trend in speech that they haven't perhaps previously considered, or if they're in a, a country which is uh, crisis hit or troubled by conflict, they can understand when different types of phrases are escalating. One, one thing that I think everyone who works in content moderation the sort of feeling that they've always had is that problems need to get big before they're noticed. And that before they get big, in, sometimes in the, something is huge. You know, QAnon is probably a great example of this. It's huge. And uh, before any action is taken, what, one of the things we'd like to do is help people uh, in these countries understand when things seem to be getting uh, bigger or perhaps words or phrases or different types of ways of expressing things which they're particularly concerned about seem to be on the rise, understand more about, uh, about why that is. So uh, that's, that's the challenge, is to develop a tool uh, that can do that in a, in a relatively lightweight way and could be applied to any particular uh, country or, or region. Without then uh, necessarily curbing freedom of speech, Mr. Dokir, do you want to add something to that as a final point? Um. I, I'm not familiar with the tool yet, so I, I, it's hard to comment. But I think that as long as it's only about observing what's going on, there is no there is no specific um, problem. It's it's an instrument to learn, really, as I understand it, which is which is a, um, a great great instrument, as as as, uh, as I can um, understand it. Um, in in terms of um, of, of conclusion, um, I think there's. One interesting trend in, in content moderation, and, and the oversight board is contributing to that, is the um, reference to international standards as the the body of rules that that needs to be applied to to content moderation, and that that's a very important conversation. Um, and then, as I, as I said, and, and that that's where Article 19 will be contributing to the Social Media for Peace project. Uh, the, the, the missing piece of, of finding a way to enable local voices to take part in the conversation, I think, is, is really uh, the, the, the challenge that we need to address in, as soon as possible. Okay, thank you for that, Giulio Wono. Uh, final word from you uh, regarding what we've been talking about this uh, past hour. Um, yes, well, just to say that uh, we, well, this endeavor to, to protect peace and, and fight disinformation and hate speech, it, 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 it will take a village, basically. Uh, and uh, the, the board is, is absolutely open to working with uh, others on this, uh, civil society organizations, but also uh, international agencies. Uh, that work, that collaboration has proved to be uh, extremely helpful and, and I would say efficient to push for certain, certain demands that have been, you know, put out for a long time. So uh, yeah, to more partnerships and collaborations to solve this problem while respecting freedom of expression and human rights. Thank you so very much. And thank you to all of you, dear panelists, uh, for your contribution to this uh, discussion. Um, it has um, provided lots of inspiration for many, many conversations that still need to be um, conducted in the future. Uh, lots of interesting questions um, that need to be addressed, uh, technical ones, uh, fleshing out the impact of transparency and all that comes with it on different levels. Um, but I also, um, if I had to draw a, a world 
cloud after uh, today's conference, um, collaboration, networks, transparency, accountability would definitely be uh, in the middle in uh, a very big, big font. So thank you very much, dear uh, panelists, for, um, for your contribution. And we have come to the end of this conference um, now um, on online disinformation and hate speech and ways to counter them. There was lots said, lots of food for thought. Um, I want to thank the panelists for their time and insights for sharing their experiences from all over the world. Um, in what is in fact, it has been stated uh, time and again, an age old quest for peace in forever changing circumstances um, and arenas. It was a pleasure and an honor to be your host and to moderate these uh, interesting um, discussions. In normal circumstances, it would have been very nice to be able to invite the panelists and you uh, for a coffee and discuss uh, further uh, face to face. However, we are just very lucky that um, technology has allowed us to get together in this way via screens and um, sound and vision as it were. For the closing remarks, I now gladly give the floor to Louise Haxthausen, UNESCO representative to the European Union and director of the UNESCO Liaison Office. From me, for now, thank you again, the best and have a very peaceful day. Ms. Haxhausen, the floor is okay, yours. Uh, you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you, Sophie, and good afternoon to all. We have now reached the closure of this conference, and I would like to thank all of you for having participated in this very special celebration of International Peace Day. Thanks to you, we have gathered a truly global audience and active engagement on social media. We have explored together how to harness the potential of digital technologies to foster peace and avoid misuse that spread hatred and tensions. We've heard from representatives of governments and the civil society from the private sector, internet and social media platforms in particular, as well as from journalists, from factors, and from representatives of the UN and of the EU all have stressed that it is high time to step up our collective efforts to protect freedom of expression and the right to information while addressing harmful content likely to contribute to violence and conflict within our societies. Let me at this point assure you of UNESCO's commitment to take forward key points and concrete recommendations highlighted today. They are indeed all critical to UNESCO's mandate to build peace in minds of men and women. Let me stress four points in particular. Firstly, we need to invest in and advance freedom of expression and access to information as an enabler for peace. Specifically, we must continue supporting journalists and their vital work, including by guaranteeing their safety. Journalists are today's lead agents of transparency and the creators of that precious commodity of verified information in the public interest. Journalism is a public good and we must protect and support. There's also an urgent need to strengthen fact-checking and enable fact-checkers. And it's fundamental to step up transparency and that was what we were discussing in this last session of internet companies, notably when it comes to data, to platform moderation and creation policies. Secondly, as we need to invest in journalism, we also need to invest to enable stronger monitoring, research and understanding of the spread and impact of online hate speech in different contexts. Thirdly, resilience to disinformation and hateful narratives cannot be built without empowering youth and citizens in general through media and information literacy to critically process what people read and what they hear. 
Finally, a leading theme of today has been the imperative of embracing the power of collaboration to address imminent challenges, peace, and build resilience against disinformation, speech, and crisis. No actor, no country can do this alone. In this, we have the unique opportunity to build on the new coalitions and partnerships developed for this purpose during the pandemic. Let me conclude with the following words of thanks to Anne-Lise for her really exceptional work preparing for and moderating this event. To our distinguished speakers, as well as to all our participants for a very stimulating debate. To the interpreters and technicians who made the event possible. And last but not least, very special thanks to the European Union and notably the team of the foreign, foreign policy instrument. This event would not have been possible without their active support of our projects, social media for peace and coronavirus facts. In ending, let me uh, um, wish you all a happy International Peace Day that may be beginning for some of you and for others, but a very happy International Peace Day and thank you for joining us today.